Hello, I'm Gustavo Tolosa and I am a starch solution coach and today I'm going to make the quinoa garden salad. I am going to show you the recipe, but it is also available on Dr. McDougall's website, drmcdougall.com. So let's look at the ingredients. Look at these colors, aren't they just beautiful? So we will have the main ingredient, which is obviously the quinoa. You will need one cup of dry quinoa. And look at one cup of dry quinoa gives this much quinoa. It's quite a lot. It is cooked in two cups of water. I have to tell you that you have to wash the quinoa before you cook it, otherwise it's, it, sometimes it's extremely bitter. bitter. Um, I washed it four times. Wash it as much as you would like and then cook that one cup of quinoa in two cups of water, um, boil it and cook it for 15 or 20 minutes. You will know when it's fluffy and it's ready. Okay, so here's the quinoa. Then we have the one chopped red bell pepper, which I'm going to add right now. This is one red pepper. We also add one green pepper bell pepper and we need half of a yellow pepper this is an entire one you can put the whole thing if you want but I'm going to follow the recipe so that Mary doesn't get mad at me and <laughs> there's half of a yellow pepper I'm just going to start mixing it so that it's not so difficult. I believe I need a bigger bowl, but I'm going to make it work for now with this one. All right, so what else do we add? Now we need two tomatoes chopped. These are two, uh, uh, these are just regular of the round tomatoes, okay? and one bunch of chopped green onions. I'm just going to put the green part of it in there. But this is a bunch of green onions. You can put the whole thing if you want. Um, I might, but I'm just gonna go with the green right now. And uh, then we need one can of chickpeas or garbanzo beans. I cooked my own, okay? So this is a cup and a half, a cup and a half. Ooh, boy, this is, I will definitely need a bigger bowl. So uh, we'll do our best here to really mix this. And I'm going to add half a cup of fresh parsley. And one fourth cup of fresh mint. We will also need half a cup of fresh lemon juice. I really like lime, so actually I put half of it is lemon and half lime. You might want to do it all lime or all lemon. I just mix them. And it needs one tablespoon of soy sauce. one tablespoon of soy sauce, which gives it a little kick to it. And then it says several dashes of Tabasco sauce. I 
don't have Tabasco sauce and I'm kind of a wimp when it comes to spicy stuff, so I'm going to leave it out. But please put as much or as little Tabasco sauce as you would like. It does also ask for freshly ground black pepper, pepper which I have. It's, it says several twists, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do several twists of fresh black pepper and we will continue mixing. We will mix until it is totally incorporated and combined. We don't want any patches of too much mint or too much parsley or you know too much of anything we want it to be combined but look at this feast for the eyes and feast for our mouths this is just delicious this does need to be refrigerated and it needs to sit for about two hours so that the flavors combine and the longer it sits the more combined the flavors are. This is like a perfect symphony of flavors. This is the quinoa garden salad. Mmm, a perfect symphony for our taste buds. You know I'm a musician and I usually make comparisons with music. Maybe this is not a symphony, maybe this is a sonata, but in any way, in any case, just delicious. Enjoy. Well, hello everyone and welcome. I hope that you enjoyed a little bit of a cooking demo. Um, I'll, I'll try to include one at the beginning or at the end every now and then. And um, just to give you ideas of starch-based uh, meals. Talking about that, well, first of all, I'm Gustavo Tolosa, in case you're for, you know, coming in for the first time. And I am a doctor in music. I'm not a medical doctor, but we are reading the starch solution by Dr. McDougall and uh, having fun reading that and learning and listening to some music, cooking. So we're having a party here. And uh, I am certified in teaching the start solution from Dr. McDougall's Health Center. And it's been many, many years that I follow this way of eating. And I love to cook and I love to help people get started and succeed. So talking about starch, you might want to try this. This is a wonderful snack. What is this? These are chickpeas or garbanzo beans that I cooked myself, but you can get them in a can, try to get the no salt added, wash them, and then sprinkle um, whatever you like on them. Um, maybe uh, garlic powder, onion powder, maybe some um, smoked paprika, or I have here some chili powder, whatever you like, or all of them. Um, and then put them in a container and shake them so that they get coated and then put them in a pan. I would put them on parchment paper or on a silicone, silicone, um, you know, uh, whatever it's called, yeah, uh, cover, um, and um, a silicone sheet. And then you put them in the oven at 350 or 375 um, or even more, 400, and they stay there for a, about an hour and I don't know, can you hear the crunchy? Mmm, so much better than popcorn. <clears throat> we will talk about pop popcorn because it's a high, high, high calorie snack. 
this is healthier and it's i think more delicious no oil so easy i just told you the recipe there's no recipe really you put whatever you want on them and you stick them in the oven uh, it depends also how long you put, leave them there depending on how crunchy you want them um, and then you can store them in a airtight container and while you're watching a movie or you can take them to the movie theater whenever you can get to one and or just reading a book or whatever you know you um, uh, wonderful snack okay so at the end I have another surprise but um, you know the previous salad you know you can just put things and take away things make it your own uh, I know that some of you don't like mint you might try cilantro you might try uh, green onions I mean who knows just these are um, just templates I guess we, you can then change them anyway I was just giving you the recipe as it appears in uh, in the website of Dr. McDougall and the, the way that I've tried it when I've attended the 10 day program and the way that um, that I make it here but uh, it makes a lot so if you want you could cut the recipe in half because it does make uh, a large quantity okay do you have to turn the roasted chickpeas during baking um, yes I did I actually did so I put them in the oven like I said probably was 400 um, and about 30 to 40 minutes and I took the pan out with a spatula. I just I just turned them all that kind of I I didn't go one by one obviously, but I just kind of turned them. Uh, the ones that are in the corner are usually uh, more brown and crispy, so I I put them in the middle and I, so I spread it out all over again and put them back in there. And then for another forty minutes or so, and then I turned off the oven and I let them sit there so that they will get crisp. Um, and then yeah that's it easy okay so let's go back everybody thank you for coming first of all thank you thank you uh, it's always fun I look forward to this time of the week and um, let's go to our book which uh, we are going to finish today chapter eight I think uh, let's look at it and it's the chapter about uh, fish which is very important because everybody uh, knows uh, when you start talking about plant-based everybody has an opinion and of course they will ask you if you eat fish since you don't eat meat meat as if fish wasn't meat but so and I wanted to tell uh, you know do a little questionnaire like Dr. McDougall does sometimes in his lectures to uh, kind of get the point across and demonstrate how much we have been influenced by media and family and friends and books and everything uh, so that if we put on our thinking caps of uh, when we were uh, meat eaters or when we didn't know anything about being plant whole food plant-based and so just to demonstrate how we have been truly brainwashed so if i say calcium you say let's make a game here to type it there if i say calcium what do you think what or what did you used to think calcium means let me see who can who gives me some answers here yeah milk sure milk or cheese so calcium milk okay good job you're doing great now what about protein so protein we think or we used to think what when someone said protein protein goes with it also starts with m yeah with meat yeah i mean even now when i go to get a, a salad uh, and one of those places where they make your salad, you know, and they say, would you like some protein with your salad? I'm thinking, you know, this salad has plenty of protein. I, I don't need any more. Okay, so 
Uh, one more. And so, um, let's see. When we say omega fatty acids, what do we think? Well, of course, omega fatty acids, the essential fatty acids for our brain that are so important, they come from, hmm, where does, do, fish, right? <laughs> Isn't this amazing what they we have been able to do to our brain? It's truly brilliant. Knowing that none of that is true because we have seen in these previous chapters how that is not true. So before we start, let's make sure that we understand the disclaimer, which is that we're doing this uh, book club for our own knowledge and entertainment. And uh, I am not a doctor who's prescribing you to leave any of your prescriptions or anything like that. And to remind you that any time that you change your diet, since food is such a powerful um, you know, element in our lives, uh, that you should be in constant care with a doctor, hopefully a doctor that knows about whole food, plant-based nutrition. Okay, so let's try here. Um, and I will share my screen and we will get going with our book. There's a lot to cover. This is chapter nine. And I will uh, summarize what we um, talked about last week. Here we go, the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. They're called essential because we need them and we cannot manufacture them ourselves. So we have to, we must get them through the foods that we eat. And hopefully these foods are going to be uh, clean foods, foods that don't have any extra protein, food that doesn't have any antibiotics and any, um, you know, any other like hormones and things like that. So what does Dr. McDougall say? Well, he says that neither fish nor animals nor humans can create their own omega-3 or omega-6 acids. I mean, fat, fats, fatty acids. So this is something that anybody that knows anything about medicine and science will, will have to admit. Neither fish nor animals nor humans can create their own omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids. So why uh, animals getting the, these fatty acids? Well, from the food that they eat like the seaweed, the algae, uh, the grass, you know, anything like that. Um, so the recommendation to consume more fish began with observations of populations worldwide that have traditionally favored fish. Um, these populations have lower rates of uh, heart disease than populations that eat primarily beef, chicken, or pork. The most notable fish eating country is Japan. But are we certain that fish holds the key to their good health? And this is something that is very important because we just assume that we're used to getting this simplified information fed to us without really thinking. We have to think Look a little closer, Dr. McDougall says, and you will find that the Japanese diet is based largely on rice. It's not based on fish. In fact, it is their significant consumption of this starch, not of fish, that explains their better health. Trimmer figures, more active lifestyles, youthful appearances. Who, who doesn't want to look younger, of course, huh? and greater longevity. Look at a traditional Japanese meal, and you will see that only small amounts of fish are eaten as a condiment 
atop a bowl of rice. And I can testify to that. I was in Japan, I was in China. Um, and it is true, fish or meat is, is more uh, served as a condiment that is served on the side or on top of a bowl of rice. Now, in the United States, where Japanese restaurants serve a little bit of rice with a large plate of fish instead of the traditional opposite, we lose, we truly lose these health benefits. This explains why Japanese people who move to the United States and slowly transition to a Western diet, which we call the SAD diet, the, the standard American diet, begin to lose their immunity, soon looking more like Americans, that is, fatter and sicker. What about the fish oil? Well, there is a lot of danger on consuming fish or fish oil. Read these later on in detail. One of the reasons that I would not touch a fish, um, I, if I, like I, I think I mentioned the other day uh, in another one of our sessions, if I absolutely had to eat meat, it would be a, a piece of, uh, of a whole piece of steak, not even ground beef. It would have to be something like that because uh, I'm not saying that I would. I'm saying that if I absolutely had to for my life, I would, that's what I would choose. But not fish. No way. Fish are so, so toxic nowadays. Um, eating fish and taking fish oil capsules exposes you to mercury. This is very dangerous. It's a natural element found in the earth and released as industrial pollution during certain manufacturing processes. And um, fish at the top of the food chain, chain have the greatest mercury contamination levels. Which fish swim at the top of the food chain? Well, freshwater pike, walleye, and bass are examples, along with saltwater tuna, salmon, swordfish, herring, mackerel, and sardines. These saltwater fish are also the ones with the highest concentrations of EPA and DHA. In other words, the fish that give you the most of these fatty acids can packed with the highest mercury level. Not just the few specific species listed here, but all fish and shellfish are contaminated with potentially dangerous environmental chemicals. Mercury contaminated seafood is almost the sole source of chronic human mercury poisoning. Serious health risks from mercury poisoning include damage to the heart, kidneys, and immune and nervous systems. In the brain, mercury, mercury poisoning can cause motor dysfunction, memory loss, learning diabetes, uh, disabilities, and depressive behavior. Even if eating fish fat or taking fish oil supplements did reduce your risk of nervous and motor disorders, which they do not, okay, let's understand that, that benefit would be more than offset by the toxic effects of mercury. And here is an eye opener for all of us, hopefully. And if you don't know these, uh, this chart will show you that cholesterol in fish compared with other foods. Mm, my goodness. Um, look at this. Let's take salmon. 40 milligrams of, of cholesterol per 100 calories when chicken has 36. So chicken has less cholesterol than salmon. Pork, even less, 28. Beef is in between 32. And some people think that fish is so healthy when it comes packed with, with mercury and other heavy metals and even more cholesterol than regular meat. Of course, the one that takes the price here is the egg. And grains and vegetables and fruits have no significant amounts of cholesterol. 
So the fact that fish is high in blood thinning omega-3 fatty acids has led to the belief that fish protects us from heart disease. The mercury that can poison the brain and kidneys also affects the blood vessels, causing the formation of free radicals, inflammation, blood clots, and muscle dysfunction of the blood vessel walls. Cholesterol in fish elevates blood cholesterol with even small doses of fish, of fish oils raising bad LDL cholesterol. So it is kind of um, disappointed that after all the research that has been published in really well-respected medical journals showing that fish offers no benefit to the heart and may even be a step in the wrong direction. Even those very respected medical journals and the research published in them has failed to influence medical schools and doctors, dietitians, and health organizations to change their tune from promoting fish and fish oil supplements as a cornerstone of good health. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just one of those very frustrating uh, topics <laughs> to talk about. Doctors are taught almost nothing about nutrition during medical school and rarely pursue it on their own, leaving them easily swayed by what they are told by individuals and organizations representing themselves as authorities. You really don't need to look far uh, to find an abundance of studies promoting a very, very different point of view. And um, I, if you haven't taken a look at these, please do. We won't do it here, but Dr. McDougall, um, is a real doctor who who knows the research and he's giving you when you click on these little blue numbers it will take you to the actual study which you can read these are all studies that show uh, that, that that there's no no health benefits to eating fish or fish oil you know these are these are um very prestigious uh, publications like the British Medical Journal or the American Journal of Cardiology um, that says that it's inconclusive and may be confounded by other dietary and lifestyle factors. Um, let's see what else here. We have the Omega study of 3,827 patients. Um, it's just one after another. These are studies that you could show to your doctor, to your dietitian, to someone interested. Not that they will, you know, most likely, unfortunately, they will dismiss them and not be interested. Um, but they are here. They, they are available to everybody. There are two important studies that show that elevated mercury in the body, primarily from eating fish, causes heart trouble. One comes from the New England Journal of Medicine and another study found that a high content of mercury in hair may be a risk factor for acute coronary events and CDC and CHD and all cause mortality in middle-aged Eastern Finnish men. So the research really that refutes any of the benefits to the heart from eating fish or taking fish, fish oil is clear and convincing. And then Dr. McDougall moves on to list some of the other dangers that come from consuming fish and fish oils. And these are serious. This is not like you're going to get a little headache. <laughs> um, so make sure that you look at them and you read that. Then he goes on to farmed fish. And if you saw how these 
uh, this fish is raised, you wouldn't want to eat it. But a lot of this comes, um, a lot of, you know, the reason why people eat animals is because they buy them in this little uh, tray and it just doesn't look like an animal anymore. And we are totally disconnected with the reality of what went on. Um, these fish that are raised in farms, they're fed by products rendered from cows, raising concern that the agent causing mad cow disease could be transmitted to the fish and those who eat the fish, obviously. Um, do you think that fish farmers will buy the best good fats to feed the fish? Well, no, they frequently opt for cheaper fish meal that contains palm, linseed, and canola oils. As with humans, the composition of a fish's body fat varies depending on its diet. With the cheaper oils, you may be eating fats that are far from heart healthy while thinking you are boosting your levels of healthy fish oils. Fish farming also raises serious environmental concerns. Waste from fish cages and chemicals used in farming contaminate the waters where they are dumped. Also, fish kept in close proximity breed disease. And this is very important because Dr. Michael Greger was talking about this the other day, that our next pandemic is going to be literally 50 to 100 times more powerful than uh, any other pandemic because we are living in a time in history where animals are kept in close proximity by the thousands. And that's not natural. It's not normal. It's not natural. These animals breed disease constantly and they're fed 80% of the antibiotics produced worldwide goes to animals. 20 go to people. Maybe you didn't know that. But it, does that matter? No, because one way or the other, you are ingesting antibiotics, which is going to make it very hard to fight diseases because we have the superbugs now that are antibiotic resistant. So um, this is just a very um, it's disheartening it's, it's the, the, to see what's going on. And uh, the fish do have feelings. So he mentions the fact that what a way of this living uh, organism or life to, to live a life of confinement and prison on a death row. So um, Dr. McDougall himself here says, while I once enjoyed fishing, now, even though I follow a vegan diet, I would eat a beefsteak before I would harm ocean life again. The start solution offers a chance to reverse the downward spiral of our own and our ocean's health. If only we could begin listening soon enough. All right, let's take a break here and uh, this discuss or make comments. You can type comments, you can ask questions. Um, and um, if you have any questions, I, mean, I think it's pretty clear that uh, we really don't need to be uh, consuming fish. Um, or any other animal product for that matter. Um, all right, there are ways to make, for example, tuna salad um, with some um, powders that they sell um, from um, seaweeds and using garbanzo beans that when you um, process them lightly, they become like uh, tuna uh, meat. And so um, it really, I have made it and I make it not very often, but every now and then I make it to, 
to eat this uh, tuna salad, and you would be amazed at how want how good it is. It's almost impossible to tell the difference. Uh, all right. So um, a lot of the seaweeds uh, have omega three, and um, then some uh, nuts and seeds. And then really, like we have seen throughout the, 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 all these chapters in the book, when we eat a, a diet that is varied and you use a different type of grains and legumes and rice and potatoes and sweet potatoes and green vegetables and, and red and, and, and yellow and orange, um, you will get enough of these omega-3 and 6 um, fatty acids. The thing is that we have to eat. We have to eat these foods, and we have to eat um, in large amounts. I'm saying large amounts because th these are, are foods that uh, are low in calorie numbers, so we can consume them until we're totally uh, full. And if you have enough calories, if you eat enough calories during the day, you will have all the calcium and all the minerals um, and all the protein and these fatty acids that your body needs because they don't need them in excess. The body doesn't. There is a certain level and then after that, and you can go back and read the book, um, they become uh, damaging to the internal organs. The only thing that burns instantly, almost, I mean, really instantly, is starch. So starch is the first thing that your body burns. And if you have too much of it, it's stored under the muscles, um, and that's glycogen in the liver, and then it's burned off as heat from the skin. It doesn't damage the internal organs. Uh, I have recorded a, web, a cooking webinar with several truly amazing recipes uh, with um, sushi, that is vegetarian, with soups, and with salads with my dear friend, Catherine Lawrence from the that that teaches also for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and she's in Dallas. And soon I will release that and hopefully you can take a look at that. All right, so let's move on and let's go back, let's go to the next chapter, which is one of my favorite. Well, I guess the whole book for me is a favorite, but um, this chapter, because I truly dislike the term vegan, because vegan has other connotations from, um, from uh, just the food. So I like to call myself a whole food plant-based, um, you know, follower or eater, not, I try to avoid the word vegan. Dr. McDougall at the beginning of, the chapter, of this chapter talks about um, a resident, a medical resident and at, at the Queens Medical Center in Honolulu and his medical intern had gone vegan out of a personal commitment not to harm the animals. But Dr. McDougall noticed that his intern, even though he was vegan, was very, very overweight, had very oily skin, and his appearance was not the appearance of somebody who was healthy. So why was that? Well, he found out soon enough that this busy intern's diet consisted of largely potato chips and Coca-Cola, both readily available in the hospital's dining room, gift shop, and vending machine. And they were actually vegan because there is no animal product in them. But he was the ultimate 
junk food vegan. Yes, that is actually in existence. I have met and continue to meet junk food vegans. So they are overweight and unhealthy like everybody else who eats animal products. So, um, you know, there are other things here that he mentioned um, that you can, uh, on its own, a diet free of hot dogs and hamburgers, fried chicken, shrimp, scampi, etc., uh, does little to assure good health. Neither does going a step further and omitting honey, made by bees, sugar, which may involve using bone in processing, wine, which I don't know if you knew that, but uh, they use egg whites to filter wine and other foods in which animal products play a minor role in production. So that doesn't mean you should give up on the idea of a vegan diet. It only means you need to learn what makes up a healthy vegan diet, a low fat vegan diet. You won't be surprised that the answer revolves around obtaining the bulk of your calories from starches and of course that's why we're reading the starch solution so um there are these fake foods that i i steer clear from them because they are uh, not much better nutritionally speaking than the animal foods that they replace actually in some cases they are worse and we're talking about here, one of them that is called isolated soy protein. Um, we will get into that in a, in a few, uh, in a little while here. Olive oil and non-dairy butter replacements are just as high in fat and have exactly the same effect. Fat stored on your thighs, hips, and buttocks. Vegetable oils often contribute even more than do animal fats to promote cancer. Hmm. So look at this, look at this chart. Vegan substitutes. A hamburger has 65, um, these figures, like it says here, represent percent of total calories. 65% of the total calories comes from fat and 35 percent from protein and the a hamburger has no carbohydrate the soy burger has even more protein and in the chapter of protein we saw how dangerous ingesting high numbers of protein is for our uh, kidneys our internal organs it almost doubles it and we are thinking that we're eating a healthier burger cheese look at this almost uh look at cheese uh 70 percent of fat comes from 70 percent of the calories come from fat well soy cheese not much different 60 percent protein 28 10. um let's see butter is the same 100 percent is fat and non-dairy spread same thing Ice cream, 55, 20, dogs and cows. It's just, look at the, at the title below. Fat, a fat is a fat is a fat. We all know that vegetable oils like olive oil protect us from heart disease, right? Well, that may not be the case. In fact, the heart healthy benefits of the widely promoted Mediterranean diet and elusive concept considering that a wide range of diets is eaten throughout that part of the world have been shown to accrue from the starches those populations eat such as pasta and beans accompanied by fruits and vegetables but what gets the credit the olive oil in fact the mediterranean diet promotes health in spite of olive oil not because of it. All right, let's take a break here. Um, 
because this is important. And I think I see somebody that was saying something or asking. Um, I have made scallops from king oyster mushrooms and ceviche from heart of palm because I miss it. Yes, yeah, there are ways. If you miss seafood, there are ways to still get to still get the the taste and even the texture without eating these contaminated foods. Um, okay, yes, fish bladders. That's correct for the beer. Um, here is one thing that Dr. McDougall is talking about, the Mediterranean diet. The, it's just miraculous. There is a whole lecture on that that is given by him and or I think it was maybe Jeff Novick. I'll try to get that to you in the replay. Um, when people say the Mediterranean diet, they don't have a clue of what they're talking about because there are so many countries that are part of the Mediterranean. So which diet are you talking about? There's like 15 different ones. Um, and even then, here is when, he, when you can manipulate some of these studies and research. What are you going to compare it with? If you compare the Mediterranean diet, which has a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, and actually a lot of starches, and it also has olive oil. If you compare that to the standard American diet of eating fast food, of course the Mediterranean diet is healthier, in spite of the oils. But it's not the oil that is the healthy part. And this is what people don't see. They 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 want to they see what what they like. You know they don't. Nobody likes to get bad news about the foods you love. So oh, it must be the olive oil. No, it's all the fresh fruits and vegetables that these people are eating. Can you imagine what their health benefits would be if they took out the amount of oil that they use, and they ate this Mediterranean diet? Well, so it depends how you compare these diets. Let's not get fooled with this. What about fats from avocados and olives? Yes, those are healthy. As long as you eat the whole food, remember that that is the one word that we cannot forget. Whole food plant-based, whole food plant-based. This whole, this olive is a miracle right there in, in that little, uh, you know, yeah, all of it. Um, it has the perfect combination of fiber, water, <clears throat> fats, other nutrients. It has the perfect combination that cannot be duplicated by any human being. When we strip that wonderful olive and we strip all everything, everything, all the fiber, all the water, all the nutrients and we end up with just the fat 100 percent of it then that is what causes inflammation in the arteries and in other parts of the body and it it hurts us let's eat the food as a, a whole so let's eat the avocado not the avocado oil let's eat the olive not the olive oil because oil is the most, um, what could we call, uh, I, uh, I wanted to say the word uh, processed, the most processed element on the planet. Is the, you end up with 100% fat. And remember what Dr. McDougall says, the fat you eat is the fat you wear, because the minute you put it in your mouth, it goes directly. Our bodies are fat storing machines. Our bodies are fat storing machines because they were designed to store fat in times of famine. The problem is that we that famine doesn't come during our modern time, times in most parts of the world, especially in the, in the standard American diet. So still, 
just know that if you are looking to lose weight, you will lose weight up to a point. Like when I was, you know, 70 pounds overweight, yes, I could still eat bread and pasta and olives and avocado, and I was losing weight at a, at a tremendous rate of 10 pounds a month or more, at 10 pounds per month, yeah, or more. But at one point, at some point, then you arrive to this plateau, okay? And that is when you have to start uh, diminishing or taking out completely some of these high fat foods, even though they're healthy fats, it's still fat and it's, it goes into the fat tissue. So if you want to lose weight, then you want to uh, limit or exclude these uh, high fat uh, fruits and vegetables, well, vegetables like avocados, olives, and all of the um, nuts and seeds and dry fruits. No, I'm not, not saying again, please don't not think that these are unhealthy. It's just that they will, at one point, they won't let you lose any more weight. And if that's okay with you, then fine, no problem. All right, so one other thing that I would say is that if you're going to eat nuts and seeds and avocados and olives, try to not combine them with starches. Put them on top of a salad. Put them in a uh, lettuce wrap. wrap. Um, it's not a good idea to combine these heavily, uh, heavily fat you know, foods with starches. All right, so I think that we have arrived at the end of our time together. I hope you have learned. You might want to go back and reread uh, chapter 9 and 10. We will finish this chapter on the fat vegan. And Dr. McDougall is not trying to, to call names and, and, and shame anybody. He's just he's very direct. So. Uh, a fat vegan. Uh, there are a lot of fat vegans and they're very frustrated. And uh, I wish so many times I could just get that across that you can be a low fat vegan and not be eating. We're going to cover next week all the junk food uh, that is vegan. And uh, hopefully you will avoid it if you're eating it, like all the fake meats and all the fake cheeses and all the fake dairy and all that. And, uh, and then we will move on. So thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure to see you. And uh, as usual, or almost usual, I will end with a little music. I play, I recorded this last night. And so it's fresh off the recording studio. Nobody has seen it. You are seeing it for the first time. Then it goes public tonight. And uh, so it's a little gift from you. I have been uh, very interested in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. It's very cerebral, it's very pure, like the starches that we want to eat. It's music written for the music itself. It doesn't try to uh, describe anything. It's just perfectly balanced and beautiful, beautiful music that I hope you will enjoy. And later on in the email, I will make another announcement that I hope that will excite you and that you will like. Will like. And uh, here we go with our friend Johann Sebastian Bach. Mm -hmm.